Okay, hello and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to wish our friends and colleagues who are celebrating Eid al-Adha, Eid Mubarak. Uh, we're delighted to be hosting this program today with one of AGSIW's longtime friends, Dr. Scott Wiener, uh, the author of the publication we're showcasing today, Kinship, State Formation and Governance in the Arab Gulf States. Uh, Scott is a professorial lecturer in political science at George Washington University, where he teaches courses on comparative politics of the Middle East, human rights, and gender politics. His uh, policy writing has appeared in the Washington Post, Lawfare, and the New Arab, among others. From 2013 to 2014, he served as a visiting research fellow at the American University of Kuwait. His academic work has appeared in the International Feminist Journal of Politics and Political Studies Review. I'm also happy to welcome our good friend, Dr. Courtney Freer, who is joining us today as a discussant to help us provide additional context during the discussion. She is the Provost Postdoctoral Fellow at Emory University. Previously, she served as an Assistant Professorial Research Fellow at the Middle East Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She is also a non-resident fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Moderating the session today is my colleague Kristen smith a senior resident scholar at AGSIW. Her current projects concern generational change, nationalism, and the evolution of Islamism in the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Her analysis of Gulf affairs has appeared in many publications, among them Foreign Affairs, Financial Times, and the Washington Post. And with that, Kristen, over to you. Hi, thank you, Raymond, for the nice introduction. And um, I'd like to welcome everybody to joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to have this conversation and it's always especially nice to do these book talks to be able to uh, learn from, but also to celebrate the culmination of somebody's really deep research. Um, we were able to do this um, earlier with, with Courtney Freer and uh, Alain Sharech for their book, um, which is also on tribalism, tribalism and political power in the Gulf. So hopefully we can put a link to their book as well um, in the chat. Um, we had a, a fantastic conversation and now it's just really thrilling to have Scott Wiener here. Um, he's you know somebody that I've, I've known for a long time as well, both he and Courtney um, really admired his work uh, coming up and it's just really came together wonderfully to be able to read his entire book which gives us really um, deep and profound analysis, both uh, trying to situate kinship politics within sort of political politics uh, literature and to argue for its significance, and to combine that with a really um, deep understanding of the Gulf states, and in particular, um, this time that he spent um, in Kuwait and Oman, um, most specifically, I guess that's right, right, Scott? Although yes. I imagine you've gotten around quite a bit. <laughs> So it's a great book. I really recommend that you all uh, do take advantage of that 30% off and, uh, and order it. Um, and of course, with these sort of academic books, uh, the 30% helps. <laughs> but anyway, welcome. Welcome to both of you. Welcome, Scott. Um, uh, again, it's, it's, it's great to, to have you with us to really look at this new book. So I thought I'd start um, the way we're going to go ahead with this. We have an hour. Um, I'm going to just sort of have a conversation with Scott about his book, hope to pull out some of the main ideas. Uh, then we'll turn to Courtney, who I mentioned is that she just published a book on this topic, um, is really an ideal discussant. So she's going to add some of, of her thoughts as well. Um, and then we'll we will have some time at the end for those of you watching to ask questions. So you don't have to wait if, if things are coming to mind or if you've already um, you know, looked at the books and have questions, you can go ahead and be putting those in the Q&A function below. Um, so anyway, we'll, we, there'll be time for your, your questions as well. But Scott, let me, let me turn to you and, and just start by, I thought it was interesting, you, you kind of start your book right away with this critique, um, arguing that basically the political history of Gulf states has been too heavily shaped the literature. And I imagine you're basically talking about the Western literature mostly here, but that it's been too heavily shaped by our focus on colonial actors and that more analytical attention needs to be paid to those societies, you know, the societies that they colonized. And then you go on to argue that of course, kinship networks um, are going to be very centered in, in your argument. Um, this kinship networks, which are based on genuine belief in common descent, 
are really important to understanding the development of the Gulf states. Um, and you go about this project then of trying to find a way to bring that into the broader political science literature. So can you first then just talk, explain to us sort of how you came to this interest in, in kinship politics, as you call it, um, you know, and how you see it as so important, how it showed up to you as important in contemporary Gulf societies. And um, it's what it's, you know, we'll have a lot more time to get into details, but some of it's political salience then for political science. Sure, yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, for having me here. I'm really grateful to the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, as well as to Kristen and to Courtney in particular. Um, I've had a lot of support from all of the um, individuals and institutions um, who are part of this event today, so I do really appreciate it. Um, my interest in kinship started, I think, actually in college when I was doing research with um, Bedouin groups, and it was more of a study of um, political violence and state society relations in that regard, but I kept getting distracted by some of the facets of kinship politics. And so they say that if you're getting distracted by a topic, that's probably what your main focus should actually be. So looking at my original dissertation research, I decided that I wanted to take a deeper dive and understand kinship, um, but more specifically to kind of extend the way that we think about state society relations from a Western perspective and sort of decenter the very Western focus where tribes aren't really a significant aspect of a lot of the things that we talk about. So it's really actually quite surprising that, you know, within American politics, for example, we have entire subfields of um, studies of interest groups or just the US Supreme Court. Um, but there's nothing comparable for tribes, even though tribes are found on every inhabited continent. Obviously, they're a really central part of governance in uh, the Gulf and beyond. Um, so the idea is to really try and frame that within uh, kind of the broader Faberian social science perspective. And so I tried to do that in the book and um, tried to bring in this component of politics that kind of predates colonialism and oil. So I guess the way that I would maybe frame this is sort of as a, a yes and sort of argument to say, you know, obviously, yes, colonialism is very important. Obviously, the discovery of oil in the Gulf is very important. These are events that had major, major effects on state society relations in the Gulf. And at the same time, politics doesn't start with colonialism. It doesn't start with the discovery of oil. And there are these pre-existing ways of distributing resources and access to power. And so those configurations are deeply affected by colonialism and oil, but they're not completely bowled over. They're not sort of erased. And so understanding that is important when we're looking at a society right now, um, which you know is always sort of in transition, but especially in the wake of COVID-19, where we're seeing kind of the second and third order effects of uh, some of the governance choices playing out, understanding state society relations in the region will be really important. Um, and so I argue that tribes and kinship in general are a really important piece of that puzzle. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's really fascinating. Um, obviously, you're, you're, you're in this book, you're going back to origin. So you do have this argument about how kinship groups are very important to state formation and the way that politics kind of formed and institutions formed. Um, but of course, we'll get on later about how that affects governance today. Um, but if you look at the origins, you're not only shifting, you kind of have this double shift. So you're not only shifting the eye or the vision from kind of the colonial powers to local society. But you also have this shift um, saying that to understand it, we, we can't also just focus on the state or central political power or you know what became the capitals of these states, but you need to also look at the periphery, right? So it's kind of a double shift of vision to these places that maybe are very neglected. So um, can you talk just a bit about that? So that's not just move from colonial power to society, but to these outlying areas. Um, how you see these, you know, I guess what you can give the terms to it that were once like non-settled areas where we had more nomadic populations at one point, how they play a role in, in state formation, state institutions and their functioning that continues sure. importance today. Yeah, so I think the, the major foil that I'm kind of writing against in the book is the idea of state capacity as the major explanation for differences in state society configurations as it relates to tribes. So, um, you know, I think the argument is, well, the state gets a lot of capacity during the discovery of 
oil and the revenue that comes in from that. And so then the state bureaucratically expands. And then that's kind of why we have this configuration or that configuration. And so um, one of the things that I argue, and I'm not the only person who's arguing this, I think a lot of the more recent literature on rentier states um, by a lot of my peers in the field, like Courtney, like uh, Andrew Lieber, Jesse Moritz, um, have said that state capacity is important, but what you do with that capacity is also really important. So that's, I think, the first aspect of this. And secondly, state capacity isn't expanding the state into a vacuum. It's expanding into political systems that already exist. And so we're not talking about just a full co-optation of tribal systems. We're really talking about an interaction between bureaucratic authority on the one hand and kinship authority on the other. And so that nexus is really fascinating. If you think about the stark differences between a bureaucratic state um, where people have unique knowledge of governance and the system, and then um, tribal authority, which is based on proximity to an apical ancestor and descent or certain constructions about descent um, and charisma and these other forms of authority, that when they come together, um, they produce unique configurations of power and they produce configurations of power that differ according to, to different states. And I think this is one area where a lot of the existing literature kind of falls short, that we say, yes, there's sort of this interaction between states and tribes, but this interaction plays out meaningfully differently in different places. And so I'm in the book really kind of trying to tease out why that is. And I think those differences really matter, especially when we've sort of just as a literature in the past decade or so really started to move beyond in any meaningful way, um, this idea that a lot of the Gulf states are just tribes with flags, which is a, a statement that comes back to the 1920s and Tassin Bashir, but does I think inform a lot of analysis um, from the West of how state society relations are configured in these states. So saying that it isn't just tribes with flags, um, mm -hmm. but it also isn't just this one other kind of more nuanced version, that there are several nuanced versions um, that we have to understand in the context of preconditions, in the context of what those configurations looked like before the start of state building and how the state building process was an interaction between bureaucratic authority on the one hand and kinship authority on the other. <laughs> Can you tell us, because um, I'm really fascinated, I, I know that in doing your research, I mean, um, there is a lot of um, historical context that goes into your research that's contributing to, you know, this, this empirical knowledge that's contributing to your concept building. Um, and I know you spent a lot of time in archives, you spent time doing interviews and talking, I imagine, to tribal leaders and to um, maybe older people <laughs> to, to understand kind of this history. Can you give us just a little bit of a flavor of that um, and work that into how you discovered then these differences? Because that's really what you're playing on, right, is differences and how this development happened um, in a country like Kuwait and a country like Oman. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I think as a Western researcher doing research on the Gulf, I had to give this a lot of thought and really consider my positionality um, as somebody who is not from the region, who's not a native Arabic speaker, um, and really try to give as much respect as possible to the narratives and the stories that are not really mine to tell. So I tried to be as respectful of that as possible in writing the book and really try to amplify as accurately as I possibly could um, some of the, the stories and the narratives that I heard. So, so yes, I talked to tribal leaders. Um, I researched through British archives. Archives. Um, there are also some incredible texts written by people in uh, the Gulf states that are not part of you know, academic presses like we have in the West, but are extremely detailed, are based on extremely in-depth interview research. And so um, taking those seriously for what they are, these really um, complex and sophisticated works, um, I thought was really important. So I integrated a number of those as well. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with two, at the time, 96-year-olds uh, mm -hmm. Kuwaitis who just the immense amount of change that they had seen over the course of their lives is really incredible. And to think about Kuwait City kind of at the beginning of the 1900s as you know, these small kind of closely um, spaced out um, dwelling places, these sort of communal houses, uh, very sort of cosmopolitan society, and then the discovery of oil and the creation of these skyscrapers and the modern city um, that exists today with cars and roads. Um, is just this really incredible change. Um, so I think it also kind of 
really magnifies the stakes of state building when we're seeing these changes happen, you know, not just over the course of a hundred years or a few hundred years, but really within a single person's lifetime. And it's just to, to think about that um, was really incredible. And the stories um, that um, some of the older Kuwaitis I spoke with told were just really incredible. Um, they were incredibly sharp and, and very generous to spend the time sharing a lot of these stories with me. So I tried to take all of this into account and present not necessarily the definitive history of Kuwait or Oman or, or Qatar, but to really sort of tell a story about how the state formation process worked with a particular focus on the relationship between uh, the state and kinship groups and tribes that the state was directly engaged with. So it's pulling out a very specific part of that story with a very specific theoretical focus. Um, and so overall, I'm able to sort of document the differences in how that engagement process happened in Kuwait, where a lot of the tribal groups in the periphery were in competition for resources. There was not really any kind of standing institution to mediate conflict between them. And then contrast that to, um, that was similar in Qatar as well, and then to contrast it to places like Oman, where many of the tribes were settled or they would settle around villages. Um, and there were organizations that managed the distribution of water as a vital limited resource. And that required cooperation and sort of a proto-bureaucratic form that was, um, I think, a lot easier for the Omani state to integrate into the bureaucratic apparatus. And so this creates meaningful differences in the way that these states and tribes interact, uh, but being able to document that history and especially being able to um, to draw upon the generosity of all of the people who took the time to speak with me um, and share their stories with me is uh, that was definitely critical to being able to shape this narrative. Yeah, it's it's so great you said that. That's actually one of the reasons why I really got drawn into the Gulf um, to do my own research too, and really got captivated by it. Was this uh, the intensity of the change in such a short period of time um, makes it such an interesting place to think about social change. Um, so let's let's get a little bit deeper into your argument then you you pretty much started to introduce it um and you're saying then that this pivotal time this kind of um uh, i guess before oil this time the organization that you found um in these peripheries um had a real impact so whether uh these countries had a more competitive environment over resources like they did in kuwait or a more cooperative environment like they did in uh oman that this later then really did impact the way that um, not only these tribes are integrated into the state, but the way that the politics functioned after that. So can you give us some idea about that? So why we should, I mean, obviously it's interesting and important for our history to have this a distinction about how this developed, but why does it matter so much in the politics or in how the state functions today? Sure. Yeah, so essentially the argument is that when you have this competition between different tribal groups, the state has to reach out to tribes individually. Um, and in so doing, it sort of reifies the importance of kinship authority. And so what that means is that kinship retains its salience as an independent form of authority, even through the end of state formation. So when that happens, kinship will have what I call governing salience. It will exist in a way that such that kinship authority does things that the government might otherwise do. And it sort of exists in a way that has independence from the state in a really important way. Um, in contrast, when you have cooperation in these proto-bureaucracies, the state can subsume these proto-bureaucracies within the bureaucratic apparatus. And so what that means is that the salience of kinship is a little bit different. The, the state is able to kind of take advantage of some of the aspects of kinship authority within the purview of a bureaucratic state. That doesn't mean that kinship doesn't matter, um, but it means that kinship has um, what I call sort of instrumentalized salience. The state is using kinship in very particular ways. So you have one situation where uh, kinship kind of sits separately from the state and one where it's much more integrated. And that's a fundamental difference in the way that states and societies are interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. um, practically, what that means is that, you know, in a place like Kuwait, um, kinship authority holds a lot of power vis-a-vis the state, whether that's through the Diwaniya system or you know the Majlis system in Qatar and other parts of the Gulf, um, whether that's you know kind of the more open discussion about wasta and about connections, um, versus Oman, where you have you know people who are part of the kinship 
structure, but are government officials um, or, you know, elements of these pro-bureaucracies that still exist in local authorities that are decentralized, um, but are still part of the bureaucratic state. So essentially what we're talking about is the sort of the independence in a sense of kinship authority and the way in which the state relates to that authority. If, um, <clears throat> if the authority is um, doing things that a government might otherwise do, if it's compelling people to actions that they wouldn't otherwise take, um, or whether or not it's being used by the state for specific ends. Yeah. Can you give us kind of one more contemporary example that sort of illustrates that difference and how they function? I know in the book you talk a little bit about, I don't know if you want to use that example, but you could draw on others, the way that you see um, tribal politics playing out I think you had the protests in 2011, but you can draw on another example if it's more relevant kind of for what, to kind of illustrate how this functions differently then. Sure, yeah, so definitely the opposition back in uh, 2011 in Kuwait was sort of a combination of tribal and Islamist factions, and uh, they were able to gain several high profile resignations. There were several rounds of elections in Kuwait. Um, I think a great example of the power of kinship is um, prior to elections, the existence of tribal primaries, um, which are formally not allowed in Kuwait, but which do happen um, frequently. And um, sometimes the results of these primaries are posted publicly on social media. Um, you know, these month, these weekly family gatherings, diwans, are a space where political speech is a lot more open and honest. And during 2011, a lot of the protests uh, or protesters would meet in uh, the diwaniya because they knew that the government was reluctant to enter this space where kind of this kinship authority held uh, a unique sort of power. And when the government did go in, it was this major event, as Kristen, you'd written about for foreign policy a few years ago. Um, so there was a sense that this authority had really fundamentally been violated when uh, the government sent police in um, to this Dilania. Um, In Oman, the system is a bit more integrated. And so you have local authorities who are part of kinship groups and kinship networks, but they also have formal government positions. So again, it's that more instrumentalized approach to kinship where that authority still matters, but it matters kind of within the broader context of the state. And so um, rather than just representing tribal groups, those individuals are part of um, the, the Ministry of Municip Municipalities and Water mm -hmm. Resources. So there's a bureaucratic aspect to it. And so the state is kind of where that nexus of um, kinship and bureaucratic authority exist. Great. Well, I think this might be a good time to bring in uh, Courtney then. Um, as I mentioned, she with uh, Ella Nood is the author of this new volume on tribal politics, tribalism and political power in the Gulf. So we're, we're really uh, um, in a golden era, I think, of, of doing kind of deeper analysis of, of tribal politics and really formalizing that. Um, but uh, one thing that her book uh, does really well is to really push, I mean, you also have a lot of tribal history and kind of thinking about this uh, in your book as well, Courtney, but you really push this a lot more into the contemporary period and look at this process of like the re, re bedouinization you talk about of Gulf society and politics and look more closely at this confluence of tribes and the issue of elections, um, even into like the new information environment and how social media and stuff uh, impacts the way that tribal uh, groups uh, work and integrate into politics or, or function in politics. Um, so anyway, I, I thought it's, it'd be great to bring you in. You also have a, a lot more um, work that you've done, Scott did as well, on uh, Qatar. So please, just, I, I'd love to hear how you felt kind of reading Scott's book, what you what you took from it and what you think is important to highlight and what he's doing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I want to start off by saying the book is really a major contribution in, in a number of ways that I want to highlight. And I, I really enjoyed reading it. I read it in like a day because I, I couldn't put it down. So I do think um, it's definitely it's definitely a welcome contribution to the field. And I think the first, I'm gonna highlight three ways in which I think it's, it's really important, especially when it comes to your theoretical um, framing. And so first of all, you, you do it really well in defining what is meant by tribal or kinship politics, which is a huge analytical challenge. And this is one that Alan Nude and I struggled in our own book, especially because people use the terms like tribalism, tribes, kinship to mean a variety of different things. And so it, it's, 
it sometimes it's shorthand for blind, blind, blind obedience. Sometimes it is actually related to specific instances of kind of kinship politics in the Gulf. So it's very difficult to, to come up with a, a broad framing um, that's accurate. Um, and you do it really well to define these actors and define them in a way that shows that they're not solely relevant in the Middle East or in the Gulf, and also that they're fundamentally modern. Um, I think this is another thing that sometimes that the baggage that comes with tribes is that they're, I think as you put it, they're not relics of a pre-colonial past. They're not kind of relics of the pre-oil past. They have evolved as well. They're modern actors. Um, and another definitional point that you raised that's really critical is that tribes are political actors, but they're not solely political. Um, indeed, they do coexist with modern nation state structures and you outline the ways in which they, they do that in the three cases you look at. Um, but their existence also has considerable influence on political, social life, uh, economic life. And I think that's why they're so hard to define because they, they kind of have a hand in everything. Um, and I also appreciated how you, you, you go into, you not only talk about or write about the way that state capacity influences how tribes interact with states, but you also talk about um, you know, the social impact of tribes. You bring gender into the conversation, writing about how tribal norms and traditions often affect women disproportionately, how marriage patterns are still influenced by tribe. Um, so you've provided us with a definition that is simultaneously broad enough to cover all the things that tribes do in the Gulf, but it's also narrow enough to be meaningful on a theoretical level and also to resonate on an empirical level. So I think in that sense, this is it has it will have a huge impact moving forward in, in Middle Eastern studies more broadly. Um, so I thank you for, for giving us a definitional framework that's really useful and that I will be citing um, from now on. Um, I think a second major contribution is that you shift the conversation away from a focus on tribe as as basically a, a means of dispersing patronage. I think especially when it comes to rentier states, the conversation often goes back to different independent political blocs or informal institutions like tribes solely exist to make sure that their members get a piece of the pie economically. And you, you point out that they are part of patronage networks, but this is by no means the only thing that they do. And I think that's really important. And to highlight, especially in, in the Gulf states, because you often hear this, especially in Kuwait, that you know tribes are only around to try to secure benefits for, for their own members. And you also point out that, that there is similar cohesiveness in the Kuwaiti case among you know, Hadar non-tribal groups. So they're not just, you know, this co we think about tribes being uniquely cohesive, and they are in a lot of ways, but also they're not, they don't have a monopoly on collective action, which I think is another um, Another really important point, and I think this will have an impact on, on Gulf studies, which is really has historically been focused on clientelism, patronage, and regime politics. And so you've shifted the conversation away from, from all of that. Um, and thirdly, I, I loved your framing of the inclusion of tribes into modern state structures through first infrastructure, then bureaucracy, and then nationalism. I think it's, it's brilliant. Um, and in my own work, I've focused just on their inclusion in political institutions. Um, which is a part of the story, but it's by no means the entirety. And because your work starts pre-independence and pre-oil, it shows that these structures predate the rentier state as we know them today. So looking at them through the lens of rentier state theory doesn't really make sense. And so you highlight that and, and draw out why and how tribal structures have remained durable um, and important to this day. Um, and I, you cite the, the literature by Costaner and, and Corey, which was kind of the previous you know, dominant literature on, on tribe and state in the Gulf. And they saw the relationship between tribe and state as, as symbiotic. And you do a really great job of showing how in some cases there is true and this is true, in other cases it's not. And so you add quite a bit of nuance to this, this argument. And I wanted to ask you, I guess, whether you think one model, this, this model of instrumentalized salience that we see in Oman versus the model of governing salience in Kuwait and Qatar, do you think one is maybe more sustainable than the other? That was one thing that that I kind of I was wondering. Would love to get your your thoughts on um, because I you know I was curious is one preferable? Um, and then I mean the last thing I wanted to mention is kind of I wanted to because this is my my interest specifically. I kind of and I want to get your thoughts on both of your thoughts on uh, the upcoming election in Kuwait. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the side of tribes linked to political institutions. Um, and so in my own work, I've tried to determine whether or how tribes enjoy a specific political advantage compared to other political blocs, given that they are this informal institution. And as I mentioned before, conventional wisdom suggests that citizens who are members of tribes vote 
to make sure that members of their tribe secure material gain or access to political, tri political power kind of for themselves. And so a tribal vote is often portrayed in a negative light as being kind of anti-ideological, anti-democratic in a sense. Um, and this presumption though is, is not backed by what you found in your book, what I found in my book. And we've seen, as you've highlighted in Kuwait, efforts on behalf of some tribal members of the political opposition to put forward ideological political agendas while maintaining tribal links. So I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of how these two coexist, this ascriptive identity of tribe and then this attachment to some kind of ideological um, project as well. Um, and I guess also related, somewhat related is the discussion that surrounded um, citizenship in Qatar during the Shura Council elections in October which really highlighted the centrality of tribes to the conception of political participation and of social belonging, proving that there, there are very political and ideological issues linked with tribes as political units. Um, in, in the Qatari case, there was you know, a tribe that many members of one tribe were not included in, the, in this first election of the Shura Council. This led to a, a huge debate over what it means to be a quote unquote original citizen of Qatar. Um, and how tribalism should affect our understandings of citizenship and, and political, belong, political participation, social belonging. Um, and so I wanted to, to basically open up the discussion to talk a bit about these questions of tribes as modern political actors and potentially as ideological political actors um, as well. But overall, just I highly recommend that, that everyone read the book. I really enjoyed it and, and congratulations and, and thank you for, for the, the work. It's really fantastic. Just uh, real quick, Scott, before you jump in on that, because there's a lot there. Um, thank you so much, Courtney. That's really fantastic contribution. Um, she's given you like a few questions there, Scott. I think mm -hmm. the first one, which already escapes my mind, actually, <laughs> because there's so much going on. But I know that the last two had to do more with this uh, political uh, integration of tribes or the politics of tribes uh, and the specific cases of Kuwait and Qatar. So I would just uh, encourage you to to tackle the first question, which hopefully you noted, and I've forgotten, or mm. Courtney can uh, repeat the it. Sustainability of yeah, that's it. That's configurations, it. yeah. And so, then uh, maybe we can all three get into the other two more current political topics as well together. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense, and I think my contribution um, in this book is more to kind of put a lot of the contemporary politics into a broader historical context. So in terms of elections in Kuwait, you know, my go-to piece would be, um, Courtney, your piece with Andrew Lieber and Middle East Law and Governance that recently came out about the role of tribes in elections. Um, I think the both of you are, are the experts on this topic um, of the three of us. In terms of which form is more sustainable, I would say that, um, Governing salience, I think, is the more common outcome in the Gulf, but I don't necessarily think that makes it more sustainable. It's a hard question to answer because the state formation process is one that takes place over the course of several decades. And so given the fairly recent independence that a lot of these states have experienced in the 1960s and 70s, um, I think it's difficult to say whether or not one is inherently more sustainable. Um, at this point, I think the challenges that the states are facing are kind of, as I said, the second and third order political and social and economic effects of COVID, kind of who is prioritized for treatment, who is prioritized for vaccines, um, bringing in, you know, kind of the majority expatriate populations. There was a piece out today saying that in Kuwait between 2015 and 2021, 55% of suicides that were recorded were from Indian expatriates. So a whole kind of other spate of issues there. But um, I think in terms of the the major kind of nexus of, of conflict and contention, it's sort of those considerations on top of the fact that the underlying drivers of the 2011 protests, um, whether you consider part of them part of the Arab uprisings or not in the Gulf context, um, is that those underlying drivers haven't been fully addressed. I think there's some push to try to address them. And I think it, you know, with the transition from uh, the previous Sultan Qaboos in Oman to Sultan Haitham, we've seen a continuance of that attempt to try to deal with some of those underlying issues of youth unemployment, some of the long-term economic issues. Um, but that adds even more pressure. So in terms of the sustainability of the status quo, I, I think it has a lot more to do with whether or not those basic economic and social needs are being addressed and a little bit less 
about the framework of how kinship kind of plays into that. Because in either way, the more pressing issue is that those underlying drivers still have not been fully uh, remediated by the government. Um, just to, to encourage everyone, I, I see that we have one question already posted in the Q&A. Um, we're going to go a little further tackling some of these questions that Courtney's put on the table, but um, we definitely do want to turn to your questions after that and your thoughts. So please be posting to the, the Q&A and we'll, we'll definitely be, be getting to that shortly. So Courtney, why don't we tackle your second question, which is about um, this kind of ideological turn in tribal politics that they've kind of moved beyond the sort of expression and uh, immediate sort of the, the kinship basis, or I guess that kind of, in, well, it is not instrumentalist in your, in your framework, but that, that framework that we're more used to about using uh, the tribal network for uh, economic gains. So I don't know, uh, Scott, do you want to take up that question first? Since obviously the question is directed to you, um, we clearly are seeing in Kuwait, again, is probably like the, the best example of this, although Qatar would also be one um, where we see tribes uh, kind of reaching even beyond tribal identity, but traditional tribal actors uh, taking on a different ideological positioning. So how, how does that, what it, can your framework kind of contribute to understanding that political dynamic? Sure, so I think in terms of the solidarity of that ideological block, uh, the role of kinship may play a role. Um, teasing out this concept of asabia and kind of how it relates to solidarity and how it relates to this ideological element is very, complex um, in a way that I don't claim to be the authority on, um, but I do think that this idea of tribal solidarity is really important. When I spoke with people who are part of these more um, tribal communities in Kuwait, including out um, outside of Kuwait City um, and some more peripheral areas, one of the common themes that seemed to come up was a concern for how modernity and modern conveniences are challenging the existence of tribes, but also sort of traditional lifestyles. And so some of that anxiety that we see in other places as well, I think is manifested um, through that tribal idiom specifically. Um, broadly in terms of elections, you know, there's a really long history of literature on democracy and um, elections and tribes in the Gulf, starting of course um, in the Western sense with the work of Marianne Tetro is really foundational uh, to a lot of this work. And then scholars in the region as well, like Khan al Najjar and of course Shafi Khabra, um, Khadun al-Naqib who really um, were trailblazers in teasing out some of these state society dynamics in very kind of sophisticated, um, complex ways. Um, I, th I think from a Western perspective, we often kind of see there's sort of the democracy and then also this tribal element kind of outside and we tend to separate the two. And so I think a more helpful framework would be to say, you know, what does democracy look like in a tribal society? Because our literature and comparative politics on democratization really doesn't account for that in any serious way. But when we see elections happening, you know, and obviously we can talk about democracy for years and years, but if we're looking at just elections, um, we have elections in Qatar, we have several rounds of elections in Kuwait um, and other countries as well. And tribes matter in all of these. So I think rather than sort of seeing them in kind of this adversarial way to say the tribes are a hindrance or an obstacle to the democratic process to understand what exactly the role is and to really honestly try and understand how we can envision a democratic society where tribes are one of the actors that are playing in this, this broader set of political dynamics. Mm -hmm. Well, how about Courtney? Um, maybe we can throw your question back at you since I know that your book, and as you said, is really looking out a lot at kind of the integration intersection of, of tribes and politics. So how do you see this uh, transition in the role of um, tribal or peripheral constituencies in general in, in Kuwait and specific, specifically, I guess? And then actually, Katsar, if you want to turn to that as well, be interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think when it Kuwait is probably the, the case where we see this the clearest or most clearly, right? And I think that one one way you can see the the switch is actually in a piece that you wrote, Kristen, about Musalam al Barak. You talked about how you know previously his father, who's Musalam al Barak, is a, a famous tribal opposition leader from Kuwait. And so his father had been a traditional kind of service MP for their tribe, the Mutari tribe. And then you see, uh, you see Musalam al Barak moving against this idea even of, of tribal primaries and saying, well, actually, you know, we should, these aren't democratic. Um, we should focus on political reform, on making a more democratic, like fairer system. 
And so he has increasingly kind of become more popular outside of his tribe due to his ideological stances about political reform. And so I think that show, that suggests that there maybe is this generational shift away from kind of blind obedience to tribe and, and just trying to secure benefit using using parliament basically as a as a means of dispersing patronage and political favors and instead using positions in parliament to put forward ideas about political reform. Um, and, and so I think it's, yeah, it's interesting to, to, because still, you know, despite the fact that there is this trend towards a political reform wing among many, many members of the tribal opposition, there people still vote for tribal blocks. I mean, there are still always tribal representatives in parliament. Um, and, and so there is still salience, certainly, and, and there is efficacy in terms of how these tribes organize prior to, to elections. And so, yeah, I, one thing I've, I've become kind of obsessed with is like, which which mobilizes people more. And I've asked people who are both, you know, kind of tribal members of large tribes and members of, you know, for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood in Kuwait. And, and you know, there's no, it's quite a personal question, right? There's no clear cut answer as to today, I feel that I sh- I'm voting on tribal lines tomorrow. I feel this way. It's yeah. it's kind of a blend. And, and also a lot even of- within one family, you'll see different responses, right? So yeah, absolutely. And a lot of it has to do with this, you know, as Scott mentioned, this idea of protecting a traditional lifestyle. And that's something that on which, you know, kind of Islamists and, and tribe members of tribal populations can often be aligned on that, that there should be fewer Westerners, there should be less Westernization, secularization, things of that nature. Um, so you do see that a little bit. Um, so I think that's, it's quite interesting in the Kuwaiti case to see that there, that also there is kind of a backlash largely among kind of Hadar non-tribal segments of the population who say, I mean, one of my favorite quotes was, um, a member of a tribe would would vote for his tribe member, even if he's a piece of wood. And so there's this idea that there's no thought that it's just kind of ruining democracy as it is. Whereas I think Scott's point of, of what does democracy or what do elections look like in a tribal society, you know, is, is maybe the more operative question as to how, how does the existence of tribes, which have predated, of course, this political system, how does that affect? Effect or how that sh- how should that affect institutions? And I think the Qatari, the start of the Qatari elections showed, you know, that that tribes do still have an effect. You had, you know, this these really a lot of contestation on, on social media about who should be allowed to vote. Um, and and also, I remember when the Shura Council districts were being draw- drawn, it was even this idea of, you know, like how can they be drawn in such a way to make it so that these aren't just tribal competitions? So it's not just drawn along tribal lines, along the lines of neighborhoods where certain tribes live, meaning that then you would just get kind of tribal um, candidates elected. So I think it's, th- I think these questions about kind of how does or should tribe coexist with with electoral apparatuses are also ones that are being taken up by these governments quite seriously. Um, and I, I don't really, I guess I don't really have like a, a major answer, but one thing that I thought was interesting is after the elections in Qatar, Sheikh Tamim, the Emir, um, gave a speech talking about, you know, the deleterious political effects of excessive tribalism um, and the need for, to kind of put national unity ahead of these tribal identities. So there, this is something it's an issue that's not just you know academically interesting. It's also something that's very relevant, I'd say, on on the policy level um, in these states as well. I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah. Understand. Well, maybe I'll add one thing, and then I want to throw it back to Scott, and especially because that's kind of your one of your last stages. You, you go from um, uh, was it institutionalization, bureaucratization to national uh, nationalism as a tool. So uh, maybe maybe thinking about that um, is important, but. Um, yeah, I think you know when, when you when you look at Kuwait and and the way that the the politics have developed, and especially under someone like Mustafa Mubarak, who's from the Mater tribe, which is interesting. And I think Scott, you gave me you know some insights and something we can think about the positionality of that very large, important tribe and the historically the role that they played, kind of bridging or, or sitting in between the two, is is really key. Um, I'd love to hear more from you, Scott, about how they were integrated and to Kuwaiti politics maybe differently. That explains their central role in a lot of different opposition groups from Islamics all the way to tribal politics. But when you have someone like Masal Mubarak, who um, really does, has, has played a role in a lot of different political formations that reach beyond the tribe, right? I mean, he was part of like the, this popular front that included Shia. In fact, I mean, prominent Shia in a more populist direction, um, and then expressing politics in a way that could really draw, speak across different tribal groups. And he doesn't even run in tribal primaries, um, which kind of tells you that he's trying to position himself as beyond that and reaching beyond it. Um, 
But I think when you look at that, that's kind of one uh, might speak in a way, as did a lot of the discourse in Qatar, to tribes kind of trying to break out of their specific tribal positionality or identity as the box in which they're integrated into the state in those two. Um, and I would say even in Qatar, actually, the way that they set the districts very much emphasize the tribe. So I, I think maybe the Amir is saying that, like people are too tribal, but he didn't set up a system that discouraged that. So, um, and, and a lot of the discourse coming from the Muter or in fact others, you know, who, who it's not just the Muter who were left out of the electoral system um, or out of the vote in the new Shura Council um, was trying to reach something that was beyond tribe, right? They were trying to make an argument about uh, political citizenship and how that should be more equivalently shared. So I, I think that's really interesting. Um, so I don't know, Scott, maybe you can take all of this. Cordy and I couldn't resist jumping into the political side of things, but you can give us your deeper basis and analysis. I'm really curious about how um, you see sort of that tribal um, identity merging with um, national identity and nationalism. And I have a question that follows up on this. Actually, I'm going to let you answer, but then we have a question from the audience about Saudi. So we're going to bring that in in, in just a minute, but go ahead. Yeah, so the, the theoretical framework I tease out in the book is that when you have this competition, which leads to this kind of governing salience that kinship has independent of the state, that the national idiom is temporal, which means that the state will define who is part of the nation based on who is in this specific area at this specific time. And so in Kuwait, you know, the 1959 citizenship law um, defines this and saying, you know, we're here before, you know, earlier laws, 1920, then 1930, um, then you're part of the, the group. And then, you know, kind of later on when you have, um, you know, kind of out West, the edge men and other tribes um, that become partially some aspects of the tribe integrated into the state and, you know, and um, kind of join the, the group of, of people who are citizens. Um, there are distinctly political reasons that this happens, um, but it kind of sits on top of this underlying true Kuwaitiness and this question of who is a Kuwaiti. And these distinctions are really important today in, in Kuwaiti society in a way that they're, that is not really the case in Oman. And so a lot of Omanis I talked to really kind of drew a contrast between um, kind of some of the ways in which citizenship is understood in Kuwait versus in the Omani case. Um, in Oman, you have an idiom that's much more territorial and one that's based on being uh, part of a unified Omani state within all these different areas. Now, it's true that there are a lot of different tribal groups in Oman. Oman physically is a bigger country than Kuwait. Um, and so, of course, you have you know, tribal rebellions that are kind of happening throughout the 20th century. And then, of course, the Dufar rebellion, um, which is happening in the, the 60s and 70s. Um, but at the same time, the kind of unifying vision that Sultan Qaboos has for Oman is to say we are all collectively within this area, part of the unified Omani state. And so our institutions are the same, our national symbols are the same. Um, Mandana Limbert in, in um, her book um, really kind of draws out these specific symbols like crenellations on the top of water tanks and um, just kind of this unifying um, idiom of nationalism, but one that's based on, on territory. So um, in terms of how tribes integrate with the nationalist uh, idiom of the state, whether it's more temporal or territorial, uh, I think is really kind of a function of how that state formation process took place and what the state was able to offer as a nationalist idiom that would resonate and that would create a sense for the state to rule. Because otherwise you have ongoing rebellions and you have not just opposition from the tribes within the context of a political system, but opposition to the state itself. So that buy-in is really critical for the state to be able to extend capacity um, and do kind of these other things that are part of that state building process. That's great. That's actually really helpful to think about this kind of territorial versus temporal um, impact on how um, and how development of, of, of opposition or even not development of opposition. Um, let's extend that to a country then that you didn't look at um, a more complex case in Saudi Arabia, because we have a question about that that touches on Saudi nationalism. And I imagine the tribal identity underneath that. Um, this is anonymous attendee you asked, do you have concerns that tribal cohesion may be eroding as the Gulf economy is rapidly liberalized in a sense that a new national identity that transcends tribal associations may be in the works? My reference would be mostly Saudi Arabia since an ambitious economic vision would maybe require taking all elements of society on board, tribal or non-tribal. 
So we definitely do have a case in, in Saudi under Vision 2030, um, you know, of a big national project that takes on everybody, um, nationalism, the whole kind of centralization of the state that's taking place right now. That's really fascinating. I'm just curious. I know it's not one of your cases, but how would you try to work Saudi Arabia into the way that you've uh, kind of dissected these two cases of territorialism or um yeah, so the Saudi case is, I think, fundamentally different because there's a very different experience with Western powers. You have the emergence of the Saudi state kind of as a, an agreement between um, Al Saud and uh, the Ikhwan or the, the followers of uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab in the 1700s. Um, and so this is just fundamentally different than having a state come in and you know have this kingmaking process and kind of build up this, this ruling family. So obviously there is outside involvement with the British and the Ottomans, but um, it's a fundamentally different case. And so I, I kind of consider it outside of the scope of the particular argument I make in the book. That being said, we are seeing, I mean, we've seen nationalist projects in the Gulf happen for decades. And there are nationalist projects that, you know, Kristen, you highlighted in your piece on Kuwait last week um, in Kuwait and Oman all across the, the Gulf. But in Saudi Arabia, it really seems to be working in a, in a way that it isn't um, in other areas. So there is tribal contention that is involved in that. We've, you know, read reports about the displacement of tribal groups for the creation of, of Neom, um, kind of this new city um, that the Crown Prince has, has dedicated a lot of resources and investment in. Um, but I think the way that I would integrate this into the book is to say that kinship is not only tribal. And, you know, when we're looking at more urban populations, what we can see is a reconfiguration of where and how kinship matter. So I, you know, I talked to a family that said, you know, we're part of this larger tribe, but we identify as kind of more of this family because that's kind of what makes sense for us to do so. And they were just very honest about kind of the reasons behind that. Um, so kind of which element of your kinship you identify or emphasize is dependent on the context. So I don't think that there's necessarily a threat to kinship, but um, it does seem likely that the kind of ongoing process of Vision 2030 and some of the social and political changes happening in Saudi Arabia will cause a reconfiguration in how kinship works, but not kind of destroy it um, or kind of roll over it altogether. Yeah. It is interesting, I think, too, to look at some of the Saudi writers too, and how they conceive about state formation there. I, mean, I was just thinking as you're talking about like uh, people like Khalid al-Dakhil and Abdulaziz al-Fahad who kind of depict the Saudi state formation process as being sort of anti-tribal at its root or of the settled people against the tribal people, if I haven't um, simplified their arguments too much. But that's interesting to think about. It might be, I, I know it doesn't fit in your framework, but um, thinking about that and then that weakness, maybe on some level of a uh, tribal identity, which is surprising, right? It's also Saudi Arabia, the one state that's named after a tribe, but maybe uh, uh, that's something to, to think about in that development. Um, let's turn to another question then. Uh, Emma Voigt argues, how does tribalism affect international political relations in Gulf countries to tribal connections reach beyond the borders of Gulf nations and influence interneighboring relations? Yeah, super interesting question. I know, Courtney, you've looked a bit at that too, so you might want to tackle that. So, Scott, you want to take the first stab at that? Yeah, so, I mean, at a broad level, a lot of the tribal groups that are relevant in, uh, in Kuwait are not relevant only in Kuwait, right? Especially some of the major tribal groups like the al Otebi, for example, who are, you know, present throughout the Gulf region. Um, so this historically was actually a really important part of the state formation process and sort of the preservation of kinship authority. Um, there were, you know, merchant families in Kuwait City, they were making a living off of the shipping trade, and um, the political leadership wanted to increase taxes on imports and exports. So these families moved all of their ships and all their personnel from Kuwait to Bahrain, and the leader actually had to go to Bahrain under the guise of just paying kind of a state visit to ask these merchant families to come back. So there's, I think, a really important aspect of the fact that a lot of these groups transcend uh, national borders, especially given the case that a lot of these borders are drawn by Western powers, not necessarily with an eye towards where kinship groups um, inhabit or, or don't inhabit. So that's kind of the historical context. Um, 
I can, I, you know, I can say kind of anecdotally that looking at, for example, the conflict in Yemen, Oman has been involved as a mediator in that conflict. And a lot of the tribes that are found in the South and the far um, are also found in Yemen as well. And those are cross borders. So that does also play a role in the manifestation of that conflict. And I think some of the Omani government's interest in playing that mediating role. Um, so those are both a little bit anecdotal, but I do think the fact that you have these tribal groups that exist not necessarily in confined geographic areas does make a difference. And I think maybe creates more of a challenge for governments that are creating these nationalist idioms because you have this tribal identity, which is very strong. Um, it's giving people not just an in-group and an out-group, but a specific orientation within that group to say, you're the grandson of this person, you're the son of this person or the daughter, the granddaughter of this person. Um, and taking that and then trying to integrate that into a national framework, um, which is, which works in a fundamentally different way. Um, so it kind of sets the groundwork for that to be a real challenge on the part of a lot of Gulf states. Yeah. Courtney, did you want to say anything about that? Maybe drawing on Qatar specifically? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, th I think in general, Gulf governments have been wary of tribes because of they are transnational identities. It's kind of like Islamist groups that they have members across borders. And so in that sense, they can be uniquely threatening. Um, and I think we saw during the, the Gulf crisis in particular, you know, when, when relations had been cut off between Qatar and, and, uh, and Saudi, Bahrain and the UAE, as well as Egypt, that some of the, the tribes kind of basically were, were seen as, as Qatari tribes were seen as aligned with Saudi. Like there was a lot of contestation mm -hmm. over tribes and this idea that, you know, how, are you loyal to your tribe? Or are you loyal to the nation state? Like that was something that actually came up during that period, which I was surprised by. Um, and, and you hear this, this argument as well in Kuwait about whether people are, are more lo loyal to tribe or to, to nation. And so this does come up when there are periods of, of contestation in particular uh, between these, these states, which I think is interesting that it still comes up kind of to this yeah. day. Um, yeah. Well, we were writing low on time and I actually have two questions that haven't answered. So I'm going to kind of try to finish with allowing those to get answered. The first one I'm just going to mention, and Scott, you might want to bring it up right at the end. It's an interesting point, I think. What do you think of David Sneese's argument? I don't know if you know this one, that tribes, in this case, in inner Asia, are themselves an invention of states for ordering societies into composite kinship groups in order to govern them. Um, so it's a kind of very strong constructivist argument. But I, I also want to take up, besides that conceptual question, this one, which I think is a very interesting question from Alyssa Christeller. She says, how will tribal identities influence young people in the Gulf region who might grow up in a city outside their tribal roots or leave home to study or work in a different county or town where they make social, political, or economic connections that transcend tribal connections? I know, Scott, you've written about that in terms of Omanis coming to work in Muscat. Uh, so I don't know, why don't you speak to that? I think that's a very interesting and speaks much to the contemporary situation in the Gulf where people are living, you know, far from their home towns or even home countries. Yeah, so I wrote a piece about this for AGSIW um, a few years ago, and um, there's scholars in the region like Ahmed al Mukhaini in Oman who are writing about this in, in much more depth. Um, but essentially, you have young people who are coming from more kind of rural areas of the state, and maybe they're studying at Sultan Qaboos University outside of Muscat, um, and then they're working in the city, um, but they're going home on the weekends. And so there's sort of this commute, as I call it, between the more urban areas where they're working and then more rural areas. Um, and so there's sort of maybe this clash of different ideas, so more traditional versus a more contemporary understanding of values and what is considered okay, what's considered forbidden or aib or inappropriate. Um, and so it causes perhaps this, this clash or this shift. Um, we're also seeing urbanization kind of expand within Oman. Um, so whereas it was really kind of confined to a few cities, we're now starting to see that spread a little bit more into areas that traditionally have been more rural. Um, a lot of people who are physically maintaining the, the farms and the agriculture in rural areas also um, are coming from the expat population, um, foreign workers from Bangladesh, for example. So uh, we are seeing this shift happen. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of how it affects youth, I do think they'll continue to be a, a reconfiguration of kinship. Um, again, it's not only tribes where kinship matters, but within kind of more urban uh, Hadar families as well. Um, and so understanding the, the role that kinship plays, um, I think it's just important to keep in mind that this is an identity that we've seen have durable salience for many decades. And so I'm not sure what will happen in the future, um, but I think it is not unreasonable to suggest that kinship will continue to play a really important part uh, moving forward. 
Um, quickly on the second point, it's definitely true that tribes can be a construction of the state. Um, I define tribes in a very specific way that are very regionally focused for this particular book, but absolutely, there are very big differences in what we mean by tribe when we're talking about Central Asia, when we're talking about Africa, where oftentimes language groups are kind of grouped together as tribes. So it really provokes this broader discussion about what it is that we're talking about. And starting with, you know, my conception, I think is a good place to, to start, but it certainly is not the end of the conversation. And I, I do hope it will be just the beginning. Yeah. Well, that might be a good place to start, to stop then, or to start. Uh, we can turn to your work to, to start a, a deeper look at these topics. And I, I just want to agree with Courtney that I think uh, you've really given a, a great, uh, much more precise definitional analytical clarity to the topic, both in thinking about its historical kind of importance, how that's affected the contemporary development of states, um, and thinking about um, these politics moving forward. So uh, once again, I just want to congratulate you and I'll, I'll let Courtney have a word too uh, on this contribution. And I hope everybody will, will take a deeper look at, at Scott's book and um, bring it into our contemporary conversation. Courtney, did you want to add anything or any last comments from the, the last questions? Really just to, to say congratulations again uh, to Scott, because the, the book is, is a contribution for Middle Eastern studies, for Gulf studies, for political science in general. I mean, it's it's really um, fantastic. So I encourage everyone to, to read it um, and looking forward to continuing conversations, because I, I know this is not a topic that's going to go away yeah. <laughs> anytime soon. So looking yeah. forward to We'll be doing some panel on a Kuwait election sometime soon, so <laughs> we can drop on these ideas soon. So anyway, thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, and thanks to everyone who, who participated. Uh, hope that this will become a resource for everyone moving forward. And please join us for some of our future um, book talks too. We hope to highlight a lot of these new works coming out. So thanks. Thanks everyone for joining us.